This is Matthew Cratter from Trader University. And today I want to answer a few questions. Basically, where's my Bitcoin actually stored? What happens if I lose my hardware wallet? What happens if the hardware wallet maker, or the maker of my wallet goes out of business? If you're interested in learning how to make money in both bull and bear markets, or you just want to see what I'm trading or investing in, be sure to hit that subscribe button. So as many of you know, I like to buy Bitcoin using Coinbase, using Coinbase Pro in particular. You can call them and ask them to upgrade uh, you to that because the commissions are a little bit lower than Coinbase. And then I withdraw the Bitcoin and I put them on various hardware wallets. Uh, just a full disclaimer, these are not at my house. Please don't come to my house. Uh, but these are hardware wallets. Trezor, I like the Trezor and I like the cold card wallet. I don't like Ledger as much because it's closed source. So I'm always getting this question, where's my Bitcoin actually stored? Not my Bitcoin, but your Bitcoin if you put it on a hardware wallet. And so I thought I'd make a video about that because it's a little bit counterintuitive. What a lot of people don't realize is that your Bitcoin is not actually stored inside of your Trezor or other hardware wallet. Your Bitcoin actually stays on the public blockchain. Here's an animation of the public blockchain. These little blocks that we see uh, falling are, are transactions. And these, these large blocks at the bottom here are the actual blocks in the blockchain. Here's the first block, what's called the Genesis block. And we're currently on block 646,435. Inside of each of these blocks is a, is a bunch of transactions. And so your Bitcoin does not live inside of your hardware wallet. It actually stays on the public blockchain, which is just this big public database or ledger. And uh, this ledger tells everyone that a certain public address holds a certain amount of Bitcoin. So what we can do is we can go Google what are the top 100 richest Bitcoin addresses. And we can see Bitcoin addresses here, for example, these are public addresses. Number four here, for example, they have almost 80,000 Bitcoin, current market value, $912 million. When people say Bitcoin can be hacked, well, that's great if you know how to hack it, or if you can pay a team a couple hundred million dollars to hack it, you can get this prize money of $912 million. It's just sitting right out here. Everyone knows it's there, but you can't get your hands on it because Bitcoin is secure. So what happens when you buy Bitcoin and put it on your hardware wallet? What's actually being held on your hardware wallet? Well, your hardware wallet stores what's called the private key. And the private key is uh, just a series of letters and numbers. And every private key is associated with what's called a public key or a Bitcoin address or a deposit address. Now, if you give someone your Bitcoin address, your public address, you never want to give them your private key. But if you give them your public key or your public address, and you can have multiple public addresses, then they can send you Bitcoin. Or if a store or an individual gives you their public address, you can send them Bitcoin to buy a car, or buy a house, or maybe buy something online. So your Bitcoin is not stored on your hardware wallet. It actually stays on the blockchain. And there's just a, uh, when your Bitcoin moves from one address to another, the blockchain makes note of it. And this is one of the important functions that the miners do. They mine these new blocks using electricity. Now, as we said, for every private key, there's a public key. If you have Bitcoin and you want to move it around, you need that private key to send it to someone. A lot of people ask me, what do you do with your Bitcoin once it hits 100,000 or 200,000 or a million or wherever you decide to sell it, I'll probably never sell my Bitcoin. But if you want to sell it, all you need to do is reverse what you did before, which is you take your, you go to your Trezor wallet, you send your Bitcoin to Coinbase Pro or any other online uh, crypto exchange. Or you might at that point in a couple of years, you can probably send it to Amazon. You can send it to uh, an escrow company to buy a house or a auto dealer to buy a car, etc. But basically use your private key to move your Bitcoin. You can send it to someone else's public address. In that case, you don't own it anymore. So you've got to be very careful. That's why I like to think about uh, a hardware wallet. It's a little bit like a password manager that you might use in your browser, for example. Now, once you understand what private keys are, it becomes very clear why you don't want to leave your Bitcoin on an exchange. So if you buy it on Coinbase or Coinbase Pro or Kraken, or Gemini, you don't want to leave your, your Bitcoin there because the, the exchange basically holds your private key. If you don't have your private key, you don't own the Bitcoin, not your keys, not your coins. 
as they say. Likewise, if you buy the, uh, the trust product, uh, GBTC, which is basically a trust that you can hold in your IRA that holds Bitcoin, they, ho they keep your private key. They basically buy the Bitcoin for you. They hold their own private keys. And so you don't really own the Bitcoin. GBTC, US government can go to GBTC or Coinbase and say, oh, uh, freeze, freeze uh, Matthew Cratter's account and don't let him withdraw, for example. And uh, another thing that could happen is one of these crypto exchanges like Coinbase could get hacked. This is what happened, uh, presumably with Mt. Gox and Bitcoin were stolen. So if you're not holding your private key, if someone else is holding it for you, you better really trust that person or that entity. And if it's a bank, if it's an exchange like Coinbase that gives your information to the FBI and gives your information to the IRS, maybe they're not the best people to trust. Same with Robinhood. Robinhood, Bitcoin, I don't even know what it is. You can't withdraw it. You can't pull it out of your account and put it on a hardware wallet like Coinbase. And so we don't even know if it's actually backed by, it's sort of an IOU for Bitcoin. We don't even know if it's actually backed by real Bitcoin. Now, I like Robinhood. I think they're a trustworthy company. It's probably backed by a real Bitcoin. But 30 years from now, do you when Bitcoin's $10 million a coin, do you really want to have to trust that Robinhood did not get hacked, that someone at Robinhood didn't run off with your Bitcoin. That's why it's very important to have a hardware wallet and to hold your private keys. Now, when you set up your Trezor, for example, you will create what's called a recovery seed. And a recovery seed is a series of words in a certain order. It's usually 12 words or 24 words. And when you first set up your Trezor, it will create these 12 words for you and you can see for example here in this middle um, middle uh, image here recovery seed they're going to be 12 words here presumably 12 or 24 jelly gossip crunch news and these are basically a recovery for your treasure hardware wallet so if your house is flooded or destroyed in a fire all you, and your your hardware wallet melts down or gets uh, swept away in a river or a tornado or someone breaks in and takes your hardware wallet. Now you can protect your hardware wallet with a um, with a pin code, but you definitely uh, want to be careful where you leave your hardware wallet. If it doesn't have a pin code, someone can just uh, plug it in. Take if you leave it on a restaurant table, for example, someone can take it and plug it into their computer and presumably take your Bitcoin. But when you set up a Trezor, you get these 12 words. And it's very important to store them in a safe place. Now you can store them in your head. You can store them in a piece of paper in a safe place. You could store them in a safety deposit box at a bank, which I, I definitely don't recommend because I don't trust banks. And if you ever really need your Bitcoin, let's say there's a, a big emergency and the US government shuts down all the banks for six months. If you don't remember your recovery seed, then you're in trouble. Uh, also someone presumably, uh, hopefully not the bank itself, but someone could just go into your safety deposit box in, a, in an extreme time of war or desperation and just take your hardware wallet. But the good news is if you have these 12 recovery words, even if Trezor goes out of business, even if your hardware wallet is lost, you can uh, create, a, you can basically restore it. And that's because these words are compatible with these very standards called BIP32, BIP39, BIP44. So even if Trezor goes out of business, you'll be able to use your recovery seed with a different wallet, with a different hardware wallet or different online wallet to recover your funds. Now, I should have said I like hardware wallets because you can leave them disconnected from the internet. They're what's called cold storage. If you have an online wallet that stores your Bitcoin, well, who knows what happens online? We don't have a lot of visibility. It's much, easy. it's much easier to hack into something that's online rather than something that is air-gapped. These basically plug into your laptop using a USB cord. But once you're done transferring Bitcoin onto them or taking Bitcoin off of them, quote unquote, taking them off of them, you can, uh, you can unplug it and hide it somewhere. Now, uh, if someone gets your private key, takes control of your hardware wallet, or, or somehow finds out your recovery seat, if you leave these 12 words uh, on a napkin at a restaurant, and the waiter knows about Bitcoin, he can use the recovery seed to immediately take your Bitcoin. Now the good news, if something gets compromised, you may have a chance to move it to a different wallet in time. Uh, but the private key and the recovery seed basically confer ownership of the Bitcoin. Whoever has those 
one of those two things or both of them can move your Bitcoin to his or her own address. And if they do that, there's no way to reverse or undo this. Your Bitcoin is gone. You can't call the bank. You can't call the IRS. You can't call the federal government. You can't call Satoshi. We don't even know who he is. You can't call anyone. There's no central authority or help desk that can help you out. So that's the downside. This is basically uh, taking control of your own monetary sovereignty. But the good news about this is once you learn how to do it, is that no government or entity can take your Bitcoin away from you. Your, your bank can never freeze your assets. They can never freeze your bank account just because they don't like something that you said on Twitter, for example. Um, they, uh, and the other news, the other good news is that you can, your, your wealth becomes much more portable. So heaven forbid, but if something ever goes wrong with your country, you can basically just memorize those 12 words in your head or maybe you put them on a secret piece of paper in your wallet, but it's probably best to have them in your head and tell a couple people in your family who are crossing the border with you. Uh, and you can basically take your money with you. You can, you can leave the country with all your money. Maybe you sell your house, you liquidate your possessions, you put it all into Bitcoin, you stick it all into a, a treasure, you memorize the 12 words, and you can basically go anywhere in the world. And when you get there, your Bitcoin is with you. Even You don't even need to bring a hardware wallet. That's the amazing thing about it. Now, of course, if you all, if all of you get hit in the head uh, and you don't remember your 12 words, then you're in big trouble and it's gone. So this is the upside and the downside of monetary sovereignty. This definitely isn't for everyone, uh, but for those who are ready for the, the new frontier, uh, this is the way to do it. And this is one reason why gold is just an inferior form of money technology. It's not as mobile, it's not as divisible and it's, uh, it's much more difficult to hide and insure and store. Please hit that subscribe and like button if you found this video helpful. Let me know your questions and comments in the comment section below. And um, also give me suggestions for what you'd like my next video to be about. Thanks a lot for listening, and I'll see you in the next video.